and welcome everybody. Thanks for turning up today for the June 2024 edition of Learn with Google, our monthly webinar uh, where we talk about um, a googly thing uh, and then uh, try and bring in some clever teachers that are doing amazing things with googly things. Uh, and then we talk about what's new in the world of googly things. So uh, thanks for joining today. Um, before we get started, just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet today, uh, wherever it happens to be for you. I am in Gadigal country right now. Uh, and uh, those people whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land and like to honour the presence of the ancestors who reside in the imagination of this land. And then flying across the Tasman, oh, I'm going to throw to Rachel. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, tihei mauri ora, i ngā maunga whakahi, i ngā wai tuku kiri ki te tūpuna, tēnā koe, tēnā koutou katoa. We just acknowledge and respect Ngai Iwi Māori as tangata whenua of Aotearoa New Zealand and we are committed to upholding the partnership of the Treaty of Waitangi. Kia ora. Kia ora, thank you. Uh, and uh, this is our team, uh, the Google for Education team, uh, and I can see uh, myself and Darren are here today. Darren will wave at people, there he goes. Uh, and I believe Kimberly's going to turn up shortly. Uh, Steve, who is normally with us, is currently on a... Um, on a flight to San Francisco. I think he's heading over there for the ISTE conference, which is next week. So that's all very exciting. Um, I think Swan's on that plane as well. Uh, we've got a really interesting agenda today. So the, the theme for today is about um, uh, global projects, about how you use technologies to work um, across distances and across divides. Uh, and I, I this is actually what really got me into technology in a big way. When I was teaching, I started to do a lot of global projects and uh, entered a lot of um, global competitions and things like that where we were working across the world. And it completely changed my understanding of what uh, education was all about. Um, and so I've invited two teachers today here to uh, talk about some of the stories about the things that they're doing. We've got Juliet Bentley up in Queensland, up in Brisbane. Hi, Jules. Hi, yeah. Uh, and Jules has done a lot of work in this space recently uh, and over the last couple of years and has, uh, has been traveling to all sorts of parts of the world to, to share the stuff she's doing and the stuff she's learning about, um, you know, working across the divide. And then we've got Sharon Cooper and uh, Sharon is joining us from uh, George's Hall Public School. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Uh, and Sharon um, is in a reference school, Google reference school. Uh, and is going to share some stories about how she's doing a collaboration project with another Google reference school in Korea. So um, both of our folk today are um, Google certified teachers, uh, sorry, sorry, Google for certified innovators, I'm showing my age there, and Google certified trainers. And as I said, Sharon is also in a reference school. So we've got a lot of Googliness to share today. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start by throwing over to you, Jules. Thank you. Um, what I wanted, if you want to go to the next slide, Chris, I just wanted to talk about why we really need to bridge these cultural divides um, because we need our students to bridge them and this is only a toe dip into some of the things that we can do to build digital literacy and that uh, cultural empathy and understanding, intercultural empathy and understanding that ACARA demands. It's about building understanding, breaking down stereotypes, promoting communication, in ways that is more authentic and more meaningful and life-giving when it comes to moving beyond the classroom. And again, building empathy is actually critical because if we're going to be com good communicators, we have to have empathy and understanding and that doesn't come if you live in a silo. So we're going to have a toe dip in to see how you might find ways to make these opportunities work for your students. So if you go to the next slide, Chris, and just, just before you carry on, I'll just get you to just briefly just give us a snapshot of who you are and what you do, because I kind of okay. skimmed over that, but um, please do. Actually, that's probably a good idea. Um, I have been a um, working with international global projects probably for about 10 years using uh, Write the World, which is a, a writing community. And my students, my writers have been very successful doing that and been published internationally. Um, and then in 2018, I was in Singapore presenting Adobe um, tools and uses in the classroom before I got involved with Google. And I was invited to participate in a conference in Helsinki. And from that, 
I then led um, a number of global projects. In 2022, and we, we, had, we were very successful. We had a gold award um, presented in Tokyo in 2019, and I was running the 2020 project. And then, of course, COVID hit. And you'll get to see some of that work later, but I'm giving you the link so you can find it in your own time because I have a timeline that I'm working to, and I know that um, I might lose a bet if I don't keep to it. So, um, but I, I did have two years working with Datacom, and that was a really important two years because it gave me a good chance to do a lot of research and to see what was going on in the world and what was going on in Australia. And Australia is not particularly good at global projects. Um, we don't, it's, it, the um, ACARA version 9 suggests that we build all of these things in and we should have these um, events taking place and these collaborations taking place, but don't actually show you tangibly how to go about doing so. But what I wanted to do is to get you to think about your lifespan of teaching. And when we think about the ripple effect of our teaching, and this isn't a new graphic, you've probably all seen it before, but it's a good place to come back to because this is what we do in our domestic situation. But how much more powerful would it be if we were to take our students and expand their world just that little bit further? so that they can become those global citizens we keep talking about creating and nurturing. Okay, Mr. Betcher, next, please. So our students do live in an interconnected, diverse and rapidly changing world and can't just learn how to participate in it. They've got to be able to appreciate it and also benefit from cultural differences. Um, developing a global and intercultural outlook is a process. It's a lifelong process and it's one we can start. And I know that um, we have a number of teachers who are doing incredible things from primary in the international sphere, but it seems to go out the window when it comes to high school. We want to be aware of the emerging economic, digital, cultural, demographic and environmental forces that are shaping our young people. And we need to help to build their intercultural encounters on a daily basis because they're in, they are encountering it using TikTok or the web, etc. But it's not just enough to consume. We need them to be um, meaningfully engaged and collaborating in substantive ways. It's a complex environment and we want them to be more than just passengers. We want them to then be able to be, be participants. So why do they matter to teachers? Well, I'm talking to a converted audience because you're all using technology. However, what we can do is use our knowledge to provide students with authentic audiences that can contribute to their learning and their understanding of the world and to help them transform rather than simply enhance their learning. So when we create opportunities for students to observe other students in other countries, they're, we're enhancing their understanding, but when we get students working with students in other countries, for example, a water project, which most people do, a water quality project, getting students to work from India, Australia, Finland, Slovenia, Portugal, they're still doing the same project basically, but they're going to feed their data into a, a specific shared um, sheet. And then, they can use that for pivot tables to look at. Look, did you notice I said pivot tables there, Betcha? Um, <laughs> but I don't like pivot tables normally. Um, but they, you can get the data. They can then start to hypothesize why certain countries and certain positions uh, have a particular water quality. What's around them? They can have the conversations. But it starts giving them the opportunity to understand the world that they're living in and realizing that they are not just singular in it that they are part of a community that are all sharing the same sorts of issues, particularly around things like water quality and sustainability. So with the teachers, it's, it gives them an opportunity to enhance their students' learning, but also transforming it. Then we come to students. Why do global collaborations matter for students? Well, I don't know about you, but when I'm teaching, if I give my students an authentic audience, all of a sudden their spelling improves massively. They start to care about the visuals of their work. They start to take greater pride in their work and it fosters transferable skills. And version nine, certainly in terms of English, they require that we have an interconnectedness in our 
curriculum in our lesson planning, in our assessment planning. And we're now moving to a situation where we, where we assess them on that interconnectedness. So those transferable skills, those uh, an understanding of how body language is actually contributing to um, conversation and enhancing people's willingness to engage. That's really important. So it gives them a chance to have substantive collaborations. It gives them a chance to foster those transferable skills. And it's using, again, developing their digital literacy because they're using it in a context that's meaningful rather than superficial. And, you know, an exercise book with a, a table on it and data is one thing. But if you've got currently updating data that you then respond to and you're having that data input by other people around the world, you can still talk about your own data, but now you have something to compare it against. So mm. it just makes it that much richer. And really, when it comes down to society, we need an interconnected, we need, we're a global community, we need to be in, interconnected, and we need a passion for innovation and skills to inform or be informed by cultural understanding, but that can enrich not only society's well being, but building community and an understanding that we are not um, in isolation that we all have a responsibility. And so I think that global collaborations are absolutely essential. And of course, the Australian curriculum aligns with the OECD in terms of both digital literacy and intercultural understanding as general capabilities in the curriculum. But as I said before, Australian schools don't tend to do an awful lot about that. And it's not enough to paint a school or go as a, um, a, a service trip to teach for a week or go to France for a month to learn how to speak French. That's one or two students. What we need is for a total uplift of our students in a strategic way that's going to lift them so they can have, as a, as a big group, the learning that takes place. Because the other thing that we've got to remember is there is no equity in those trips. There are so many students who will never leave Australia or never leave their home country to not make global connections and collaborations happen where they are meaningfully talking and building things, that means that they're being denied the opportunity to learn about other cultures in a real environment. And that's an equity issue. So mm -hmm. the wonderful thing about Flex is it's repurposing computers so that maybe some disadvantaged areas and schools are getting access to being able to use these wonderful Chromebooks. And they are able to then communicate with where they're possible with other groups. And I've been doing a lot of work with the Asia Europe Foundation in that area. But we are, as teachers, all responsible for digital literacy and cultural understanding. It doesn't matter what subject we teach. And this is why I think that these collaborations can be and have proven to be um, effective across the curriculum. It's about real life applications. And, you know, the problem most people have is that they, Think it's a great idea but then they wonder how they go about doing it mm. and the tools that are necessary for that so you can click on again mm -hmm. because that really is i think what a lot of teachers face there are too many things to look at too many different ideas and no through road there's no one singular way to look so i'm going to suggest if we turn to the next slide that you identify groups that, are make, that make these things possible. Now, I've been working with the Asia Europe Foundation now for five years, six years. And I'm currently um, working with several teachers from seven different countries on different projects. The Asia Europe Foundation Classroom Network has been providing capacity building opportunities for collaborative teaching and learning. And they provide a platform to explore potential of cutting edge ed tech tools and the integration of education for sustainable development. But now we're moving into all of that, but looking at AI and the implications of AI and the ethical implications of AI and the practical applications of AI. Um, it, they do it across secondary, high, and vocational schools in Asia and Europe. Its target group is broad because it is intergenerational and it has multiple stakeholders. And students, teachers, policymakers, ed tech experts are all involved. So it's really important. It's had, since its inception, it's about 20 years old now, it's done about 
1900 or well, 1900 teachers from Asia and Europe have participated in the class nets. There's been a result of 35,000 students involved in projects and then spin off projects. So you start to see the reach and for each of those schools and for each of those students, it opens up the world again and there will be a ripple on effect for them. Just as we looked at our ripple on effect, mm. when we consider the ripple effect of our students, it moves us further. And, you know, in this current um, project, there are 242 participants and 42 mentors. So when you think about, again, the, the impact of that in the classrooms of Asia and Europe's schools, we're starting to see that we are yep. making, we're getting a snowball effect. Those students will be able to move forward. Um, I'm not going to stop and show I'm, you. The I'm just dropping the links in the chat so that yeah. um, anyone wants to follow. In the chat, or if you'd like to see um, the 2019 postcards from the Edge project, I ran this one actually won a gold award, and you'll see how all the students are actually supporting and integrating and collaborating and the collaboration is absolutely wonderful and if you do go to the end of the seven video seven minute video you'll see students responding to each other's work in a way that's really quite meaningful yeah. um we'll share the slides out so everyone will get the slides with the links so yeah we'll have to look. yeah so this other this next slide is again it's basically so you can see how google fits in because I've, i wouldn't have been able to run these the projects i have without using google uh, google sites as my my tool using classroom and lots of people use um, google classroom to run their projects they use google meet for their meetings they're using forms and they're doing their collaboration in docs there are so many ways of using the tools that make these um, projects possible and to do it in classroom means obviously that the students are protected but google earth uh, i love google earth and that was a wonderful way of again integrating the curriculum because the crit, we don't live in silos. We live in an integrated and somewhat messy environment. So what we did was we asked um, the teachers who are participating what tools they would like to use and the tools that they found most effective. Next slide, Blitch. Mm -hmm. So what do you think would be the most effective and easy communication medium for team learning phases based on their experience and their answers? Next slide. Yep. Show you. They are looking at workspace. They're looking at, they are still looking at um, Microsoft and they are still looking at things like Slack. But the majority, because we have such a large number of Asian um, and European, but mostly a lot of Asian schools involved, Google is very, very prominent in Asia. And when I, when I talk to the Asian teachers, that's their, their default. They work with Google. So as a consequence, the Europeans tend to then work with Google. So it's not surprising that Google rep is represented very well here and all the tools are so powerful in that area. But by giving people the opportunity to work together to use the tools effectively, they're developing their digital literacy, but then obviously they are then building the digital literacy of their students because their students are now starting to use these tools in meaningful, authentic ways. And it becomes second nature. That's the default. They know because they use. And that has implications then for other things they do in school. Um, so it has, it is the tool of choice. Oops, today, so let me just go back a sec. Um, our students do live in, in, in an interconnected world. It's a diverse and it's a rapidly changing world. And Emerging, as I said, the emerging economic, cultural, demographic and environmental forces are having an, imp um, an impact and our students need to be able to tolerate ambiguity in order to be able to manage themselves and the context they find themselves in. They've got to learn to participate, appreciate and be future ready citizens that can thrive in an ever evolving world because, you know, it's not going away now is the time to make global connections happen while building their digital literacy particularly when it seems the world is shrinking and it's awesome. it's also amazing that there's so much intolerance and that comes from ignorance so by by educating our students they are at least informed 
anyway, that's me. Nice one. Thanks, Jules. That's awesome. And I concur with everything you've said there. And I, as I said, I've done quite a few global projects over the years and everything you say is 100% true. It's so engaging for the teachers and the students. And I actually wouldn't have stayed in education had I not done some of these projects. I would have mm. got bored and moved away. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Awesome for that. Uh, now we're going to switch gears over to uh, Sharon. And Sharon, I'm going to throw over to you. I'll get you to introduce yourself before we start. Um, uh, and then tell us what you're up to. Yep. Um, hi, I'm Sharon Cooper. I'm the technology teacher at George's Hall Public School. I work three days a week in the computer lab, basically. And um, the class, all the classes come to the room to have a 40 minute lesson on technology, whatever that might be. <laughs> but we are, we have one to one Chromebooks at our school, so they um, bring their Chromebooks with them so I can um, have lessons that way. So it's pretty good. Nice. Excellent. <laughs> all right. So um, the Korean exchange began with a visit to our school by three teachers from Sangbook Middle School. Um, it started with an email from Chris, if anybody would like to host the teachers. Um, and we said yes, and so they were able to visit a few of our classrooms, um, talk to our principal and our deputies and um, see what our school was like. Next slide. And we spent more time together oh, yep, at the Google Champions Symposium later that week. So that was in December last year. And um, part of the Korean group, I was also introduced to Sarah from Gagok Elementary School. And so we've now, next slide. We now have, uh, we're now running a collaborative exchange with both of those Korean schools. So with Sangbook Middle School, where, who are also a Google reference school, they've got about 40 year seven students. They're working with our OC class, which is a selective class in our school. And that's uh, 30 students, 15 year six, 15 year five. And the original aim was to meet once a term uh, using Google Meet and um, having some conversations in between with the teachers and we're communicating via Google Chat with those teachers and um, the OC teacher, which is Aileen Law, and then myself, I come in and help her. So next slide. So we had our first meeting in April. Um, as you can see, all the students are just in a group watching one screen, one panel. Um, so our students are in the computer lab watching what was happening on the panel there, um, and they're then the Korean students are all sitting watching the panel. Um, we had some demonstrations of K-pop dancing, some um, other things about Korean culture, uh, and then our students presented uh, to their students about our school and some of the things around Sydney, Australia. So uh, that was a really great first meeting. Uh, so our next meeting, next slide we had in June, it was early this week. Um, so the Korean students presented about Korean food. So that's um, that one's about kimchi. Um, part of the thing, uh, part of their purpose is really to give a real world audience to their students who are learning English. So they've got a, a purpose, they're producing Google Slides to present to us. Um, so that that way they're, yeah, they've got, uh, as I said, an, a real world audience so that they can uh, speak English and have a reason to improve their English. Mm. Next slide. Uh, and as part of this second meeting, we actually managed to get into breakout rooms. Um, we found that we need to um, run the meeting from a Google Classroom for the Department of Education. Our students were blocked from entering any meetings outside of that domain, but we're able to admit the, the Korean students and teachers into our classroom. So uh, we had 12 breakout rooms. So there were three, three or four of each uh, Korean and Australian students in each group. Uh, so that worked really well because all of a sudden there was a smaller audience so that they could actually speak to each other. So mm -hmm. our students developed 
a, a quiz about um, Australian culture. So one of the ones they were talking about fairy bread, and you can see that they've actually translated it as well to for the Korean students. And then they would have their next slide would say, um, choose an answer, like a multiple choice, which one is correct? And then um, the Korean students then weren't forced to know a lot, but enough that they could participate in the quiz. So each, each breakout room had a quiz like that. And next slide, I think. Yes, so what happened at the end of those quizzes and the conversation started, we found that some of our students didn't know how to talk to somebody that they hadn't really met before. So the, the teacher, Miss Law, she quickly wrote on the whiteboard some conversation starters. Uh, some kids were fine with it, but I talked to um, Aileen today and she's really happy that that was happening for her students because they're a selective group. They do spend a lot of time in tutoring and um, activities, uh, piano lessons or music lessons. And so they really, she was really happy that the students were actually engaging with other people, having a conversation. And you can see the difference. The smiles on the faces of our kids here was amazing. Like the fact that they, but it was slow starting for some, it was a slow start for some of those students. Um, and in the meetings, we let them use the chat as well so that they, if the Korean students weren't confident, they could um, type in English rather than speak in English. So it's been, it was really great. Like it was something we hadn't thought of as um, a positive that would come out of this exchange, but now we realise that it is. So that's part of the social and emotional learning. And we didn't realise that some of the students didn't have that skill. So it's, but that was great. Uh, next yeah. So uh, the second collaboration is with Sarah at Gagok Elementary School. So she has a group of seven year six Korean students and they're part of a school club. Um, so our year six teachers, I got, uh, I asked them to choose two students from each class and we meet once a week uh, for about 30 to 45, uh, 40 minutes. And we're aiming to meet at least three times each term. And, um, the teachers are communicating, we're using Gmail and Google Meet with, with this school. The next slide. So we're using a Google site um, and it's closed, like it's only open to those students and teachers. So we're keeping it safe for the students. So that's our homepage. And then we have, uh, I think, did I put something on the next page? Yeah. So the students at the first Google Meet, they, um, had to do a student introduction using Google Slides. So they presented to the meet. And then we um, put all of those introductions on the Google site so that the Korean students could go back and have a look and find out a bit more. And the, our students could go back and uh, see what the Korean students were telling about. So we had things like favorite food and hobbies and things like that. So. That was a good thing. Um, and the next meeting we had, we did school introduction videos and we've shared those on the Google site as well. And what we found really successful was the students went out and took photos around the school with the iPads and put some text on each slide. But we used that record button, which I've learned about with, in one of the, you know, in a Learn with Google session. So we were just able to press record and the students just came up to the screen and read the text that they'd created and we did it in one take <laughs> and then it just created a video for me that we just played for them at the meeting so we were able to create the video quite easily and then we were able to share that video and then that's on the google site as well so they were able to go back to that the korean students to probably do some translating and things like that so that was a really good tool that we uh, were able to use. Next slide. Um, we had a third meeting that was just for solving some technical issues. And that's where that helped with the um, Google Meet this week. But the, um, it was that problem of how do we get everybody into the Google Meet without the department stopping us. So we've also used, started to use the classroom link because I've got a Google Classroom just for these students at our school. So it's our Korean Exchange Club Google Classroom. And 
Um, that was really good. So all the students are there, I've blurred faces because I'm not sure of the permissions that students have in Korea and students have here. So, But it's just to show that we had everybody on. Um, so that was really, really great. So, yep, next slide. So um, they've sort of been matched with the students. So there's seven students. So we've got two boys are with one of the Korean students, but otherwise they're all matched with one-to-one one -one students. And they want to do email, but I wasn't sure of the safety. So we've created a shared Google Doc. So there's two students and all the teachers are in it. So, And they've already started communicating and the students turned up, we have a Wednesday after recess meeting and they're like, oh, my student, you know, my Korean friends, they've already talked about it. So <laughs> they've already sent me a message. And so that it's just to get them to communicate with writing, I suppose, and just to ask questions of each other and hobbies and things like that. Okay, next one. Amazing. <laughs> so, our, so, and in that third meeting, we had the two breakout rooms. We had a girls group and a boys group. And so the girls group um, were talking about K-pop and their favorite K-pop singers. We actually started the meeting with uh, two truths and a lie. So they had to tell two truths and a lie about themselves and then get people to guess which one. And they'd put their answer in the chat and they'd say, oh, yes, I do like maths or I don't like mushrooms or something like that. It was quite good. And then with the boys group, they were talking about uh, soccer and favourite sports and favourite teams and things like that. So it's been really successful. Like, um, I think that's the last slide, but... Um, yeah. Yep. So with the next thing, um, the OC classes with the middle school, they're going to work in co-spaces and build a sustainable school. So uh, we're going to start that for next term. So that will be sort of happening in the background and um, then we will still have a Google Meet. But it's it's been successful like so far. It takes a little bit of work finding the right time to meet um, with different uh time zones it's lucky now we're only an hour apart so uh it, it's been great it sometimes i'm uh trying to work out the technology but uh, there's always seems to be a solution so um the google tools we're using have been really helpful thank you sharon that's amazing that's i love hearing all those stories can we um big it up with a a little emoji burst for uh, for our presenters today Thanks, everyone. That's awesome. Um, I, I think um, you make a really good point there, just that last thing you said about only being an hour apart. Um, I think it's something like 70% of the world's population exists in that time zone throughout Asia. And so, you know, 70% of the world's population is within probably, you know, a three-hour time window from where most of us are. Uh, and I think being able to take advantage of that is pretty outstanding. Um, thanks again for sharing. Uh, we'll we'll make all of these slides available at the end for anyone who wants to go through them. Uh, I'm really inspired now. I want to get back to a classroom. <laughs> um, the, just to finish off, we're going to just uh, talk about the. We usually just wrap up with uh, some of the stuff that's new from Google. So I just want to take you through some of the new stuff that we've announced. Uh, this is either announced and is already live, or it's announced and is coming very soon. So if you don't see it yet, um, it's only. Uh, probably a few days or weeks away. Um, so these are some of the things we'll talk about. Uh, Gemini was re formally released. Um, I mean, Gemini's been around for a little while now uh, as our generative AI solution. Um, but there's a couple of changes that are on the way. Uh, this first one here is Gemini Chat. So if you go to gemini.google.com and you use the Gemini generative experience there, um, it is free for anyone to use. You can go and use it with your Gmail account. Um, you can, if your school has turned it on, you can use it on your school account as well. Um, what is coming to this is if you access Gemini with your school account, then the data will be protected. You'll get added data protection. So the, the data won't be used to, uh, to train the model, won't be reviewed by humans, won't be shared with anybody. Um, so that's coming very soon. So long as you access Gemini chat, which is like the publicly available one, with your workspace account, it'll be protected data. Uh, so that's pretty cool. That's a free service. Anyone can use that. Uh, anyone who's over 18, I should say, because uh, it's not yet available to under 18s. Um, so 
The other thing that's just been released uh, is what we're calling Gemini Workspace or Gemini for Google Workspace. Um, we're calling it Gemini Education, but what it really means is Gemini working within Google Workspace itself. So not the chat experience, but a different kind of thing. The idea of the Gemini for Google Workspace experience is that it will help you write, visualize, organize, and connect directly inside Workspace. So I want to give you just a little snapshot about what that's about. Um, you'll see uh, that you've got the ability there, those two little uh, GIFs that are running there, the Gemini across Workspace apps, you'll actually get Gemini turning up inside Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides, Gmail, uh, I think in Meet. So it will actually appear in different parts of the Workspace interface. So when you're in a Google Doc, for example, instead of having to go off to somewhere else, you'll get a, a box that'll pop up inside your Google Doc. Um, now, I should point out that the Gemini for Google Workspace is not going to be a free service. It will be something that is a paid service and schools will need to buy a license to do that. And as you're probably realizing from looking, if you've been paying attention anywhere, none of this generative AI stuff is particularly inexpensive, um, So, but there will be a cost involved with using the, the Gemini workspace stuff. The other thing is if you, if you are using a Gemini license in workspace, You'll still be able to use the Gemini chat experience. You'll still have the access to the um, the protected data and all that sort of stuff, but you'll be using uh, an even better training model. You'll be using Gemini 1.5, not Gemini 1.0. So it, it's the same kind of thing, but with a, with a more sophisticated model behind it. Um, we've also, so I can just lay it out there. So these are your kind of options in the Gen Gemini AI world now. You've either got the Gemini chat experience, which is free for everybody, no cost. Sorry, correct myself again, free for everybody over 18. Um, and it uses Gemini's 1.0 model. Or for schools that want to buy a license for Gemini, they can have that integration directly inside Workspace and they'll get a whole bunch of uh, additional functionality with the improved model uh, being embedded directly inside the Workspace apps. So that's all happening right now. Um, the chat experience protection stuff is coming very soon. I hope that makes sense. Uh, it's, it's pretty exciting what's happening with Gemini. Um, the, come, some of the other things that are happening, uh, for those schools that are using Gemini, uh, there will be now the ability for your school administrators to actually see who's using uh, or how much it's getting used, because obviously if it's a service that you're paying for, you want to make sure that it's being used. Um, uh, administrators will be able to go inside the admin console and actually see usage reports for Gemini. So uh, I think that'll be really helpful in, in allowing schools to understand what the usage of these tools is like um, and, and uh, promoting that usage. The other really exciting thing that we announced uh, in Google I.O. a couple of weeks ago, uh, we announced a whole bunch of stuff, but this is, I think, one of the most interesting things to me is it's called Notebook LM. We announced it last year, but it was only available in the U.S. And as of, I think it's last week or the week before, it's now available globally with additional features. Now, I love this tool. Uh, Rachel said there in the chat that she's loving it. Me too, Rachel. I think this is Probably of all the things we're doing in the AI space, I see this as one of the most useful for teachers. What it is, I'd encourage you to go and have a look at it. Just go to Google and search for Google Notebook LM and you'll find it, find the link for it. You can use it with your Gmail account at the moment. And if your administrator has enabled it for your domain, you'll be able to use it with your Workspace account but it could be possible that it's not turned on for your domain. So if you don't have access in your school domain, you can certainly use it with a Gmail account if you wanna have a play with it. What it lets you do is to take individual sources of information and upload them into Notebook LM and then use the AI experience to interrogate that information. So let's say you're doing some research and you've pulled down a whole bunch of articles about things you, you know that you wanna, um, to look into. So you might have you know, three PDFs of research reports and you've got a page of notes you've made yourself and you've got a couple of Google Docs. You can take all of that stuff and put it into this notebook and then start to ask questions about that data. It, it will summarize the data for you. It will create study guides from that data for you. Um, it will create frequently asked questions. It will create a timeline if there's, if there's time things that's mentioned. It is really, really clever. And I would strongly suggest to anyone who wants to have a play with this, uh, go and have a play with it because it's awesome and it's free at the moment. 
a couple of other things that have happened. Um, we ne announced a nice little thing in Sheets recently uh, that if you have a Google Sheet, there's the option now you can go into the menus and uh, turn on the ability to get notified on a conditional notification. So if something happens in that sheet, some change happens, uh, it can trigger an email. So for example, you might have a, if, if the status of a drop down list changes, or if the total number of participants adds up to a certain number and you know, it exceeds that number, you can you can create all sorts of conditional triggers onto how, um, uh, how you want to be notified about those changes. Really great if there's sheets that you need to keep track on, but you don't want to have to go and visit the sheet every single day. Uh, it's really handy for that. Um, some of you might be using Spaces, which is our uh, community chat thing in or community chat spaces inside Google Chat. Uh, up until now, you've had to be invited into a space. So the person who created the space has to actually add your name to it. Um, we're now offering the ability for the chat space owner to create a public link for that chat space. And when you give the link to someone, they can click a button to request to join. And I see this as being really useful for um, like schools that are trying to create communities around different things, or maybe you're trying to create a club, or you know, as as our two speakers spoke about today, the idea of being able to create a uh, like a, a space where people can interact. So you can now allow people to uh, request access to a space rather than have to you know be added by the administrator. Still has to be approved by the administrator, but they can request. Uh, and this one too, I thought was interesting. Um, when you get a lot of um, things that, like Google documents that are shared with you, or um, uh, just when people make changes inside your Google Drive, if you haven't been active on Drive for seven days and you've got multiple things happening in there, like people have shared files with you and things, it will it will create an email and send you a once a week email to give you a summary of all the things that have been going on inside your Google Drive that require your attention. You can turn it off, so if you get too much email, you can unsubscribe from those updates. But this is what will happen by default. You'll get a digest email once a week to give you a link to what's happening inside your Google Drive. Uh, it could be really handy if you've got a busy Google Drive like me. And then the final thing is, uh, this is uh, we'll all be very happy about this, is practice sets. You can now insert images into practice sets. Yay, look at all those smileys. Um, you have not been able to do this at this point. Uh, you've been able to take a snapshot from a PDF and include that. So if your image is in a PDF, I guess you could kind of get around it. But you'll now be able to just upload and import images from, um, from your Google Drive or directly from your computer. Uh, so that will be, I think, really a nice feature to be able to add that, that graphic element into these quizzes. The other nice thing is, uh, you might remember a, a little while ago, we extended the ability to be able to import a Google form. So if you had a quiz that was built in a Google form, you could import that in and, and it would turn it into a practice set question. Um, but the, 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 if you had images in that form, it, they didn't come across. They will now come across from the form. So it will bring everything in. So there you go, there's some updated uh, bits and pieces from the world of Google. There was always tons of changes. I only distill it down to the five or six things that I think probably you guys will find the most interesting. Um, but if you want to know more, uh, just search for workspace updates and you'll find the uh, the page that has all of those changes listed in one place. All right, Darren, I've been talking a lot. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> no, no, you covered it all. There's a lot of exciting things coming. And uh, as you mentioned, Betch, ISTE is happening this week. So I'm sure there'll be another flood of announcements uh, coming soon. So. Yeah, Keep it absolutely. On space. Absolutely. I didn't really unpack all of the stuff from Google I.O., but we did announce a ton of stuff at Google I.O. Most of it was AI related. Um, so if you, if that if the AI stuff interests you, you might just do a little search in YouTube for um, Google I.O. updates, and I'm sure you'll find a ton of videos that unpack them. Um, and as Daz said, we've got ISTE coming up in the U.S. next week, and that is traditionally where we announce a whole bunch of new stuff as well. So. Uh, I can't really speak to what we might or might not announce, but I'm sure it will be exciting. Um, for those that haven't done it yet, we have a platform now for Google educators if you are a Google champion. So if you're an innovator or a trainer or a coach, uh, we have a platform for those folk to um, to share and talk and um, share ideas. It's just at www.googleforeducommunity.com. 
Um, and if you are one of those folk, uh, please make sure you are part of that because it's a pretty cool place. There's also a spot in there too if you are a Google administrator. So if you look after a Google domain, we've got a, a part of the hub in there is for the Google GEAG hub. It's not cryptic at all. The Google Education Admin Group. Uh, there is a, a place for you guys as well. Oh, there you go. There's a little close up. Um, so that is us for this month, and I almost kept us on time. Very good. Thank you, Jules and Sharon, for, uh, for helping keep us on time. Um, we love to get your feedback. Really, 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 really appreciate your feedback. In fact, we appreciate it to the point where if you uh, fill in the feedback form, uh, I will wait 24 hours and then pick a name at random and send you out a little bit of Google swag. And I know, uh, Jillian, you got a few things in the mail a little while ago. And uh, Jeremy, who's also in the call today, Jeremy was um, last month's winner. And Jeremy, if you haven't got your swag yet, it's because Steve's been slack in sending it out. But I did remind him yesterday. So um, hopefully you'll have something on your way soon. Um, I'll just leave that slide there for one more second. Please, uh, please do fill in that feedback form and hopefully win something. Mm. Uh, I might just, uh, oh, you put it in the chat. Uh, Dar Darren put the link in the chat in case you missed it. Uh, if you want to access any of our previous webinars, we record them every month and put them on our YouTube channel uh, on a playlist, and that's the address there, bit.ly slash LWG underscore rewatch. So you can go and uh, rewatch anything that you might have missed. And of course, if you visit the, I will follow up every month with a with a just a follow up email after each session, and uh, it will have all the notes and the link to the slides and everything else all there. And if you want a PD certificate for attending today, uh, there's a link bit.ly slash GFE certificate. Note the capitalization on G and E. Um, if you fill that in or scan the code, fill that in, and it will create a certificate form and email it straight back to you. And with that. Ladies and gentlemen, I will wrap things up. We will stick around. I'll stop the recording, but we'll stick around for a few minutes if you have any questions. Uh, we're happy to try and answer them. Um, there's a couple of addresses on the screen there. If you are part of New South Wales, Victoria, or South Australian systems, uh, and maybe Ryan, if you can tell me what the address is for uh, ACT, I'll add that one as well. Um, some of the things we talk about as new features may or may not be available in your specific system. So if you have questions about that, these are the, these are the people you need to direct those questions to. Special thanks again to Jules and Sharon uh, for sharing your wisdom today. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop the recording, say goodbye, uh, but hang around. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank guys. You.